Welcome back to the Missing Mora Murray podcast. I'm Tim here today with Lance in the Crawl Space Studios. Lance, how are you? I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm doing well as well. We had a really kind of a wild weekend up in New Hampshire last week, didn't we? Yeah, still not really, but still trying to figure out how to come down from all that. That was a, a whirlwind of activity. Long days, two days that really felt like two weeks, but it was so worth it to, to get this taken care of. And still trying to kind of process all the things that we learned. And I think it's important to tell everybody th- what we did. Right. You mean process both um, the samples that we took as well as mentally process exactly what we did up there. Well, I I meant mentally process because I can't physically process the samples that we took there, um, but we are wanting to do that. And we have some people who have reached out and we've reached out to people uh, regarding soil samples. uh, But let's let's get to what we actually did with the people that we uh, who joined us, the professionals who joined us. Ed and Graham from GB Geotechnics, Inc. out of New York. So quick bit of background on how this happened. Ed is the principal of GB Geotechnics, and he reached out to us because he'd listened to the podcast and thought that his services could be useful, and he did this pro bono, which means for free. He went up there, took Graham with him. Graham is now, in my head, the soil whisperer. (laughs) Graham is actually uh, an investigation engineer, and he did know a lot about soil and and what a disturbance would look like. And they were very clear before we even went up there that we're not going to see, like, any figure that we're going to be able to tell or anything like that from their equipment. All they'd really be able to show is disturbances in the soil, and then it's up to us to either core or to dig down or somehow figure out why that was disturbed. Soil and and uh, concrete. If you have concrete that's been poured, you can see through the concrete, you can see what's inside the concrete as far as any sort of reinforcement, and then you can see into the soil. And then if there looks like uh, anything that's not normal with how the soil layers, if there's some sort of disturbance or break in those lines, then you can say we should take a sample and based on the results of the sample, then you say, well, we're going to dig or we're not going to dig. And so we'll just start with what we were doing on Saturday at the A-Frame house. And other people who were there, of course, investigative journalist Maggie Freeling joined us, which was nice to see her. The Murray family as well, Julie, Fred Jr., Kurt, and Julie's boyfriend were there. And then we were joined by Chuck West a little later on. He said originally that he might stop by, but he ended up stopping by, stayed for quite a bit of time, and we had a really, really cool conversation with him. Of course, Chuck West of the Cold Case Unit in New Hampshire, and we did. We only spoke to him for about five minutes, but it was really interesting to uh, hear what he had to say. And he said, one of you on your podcast asked the other one a question one time. It's like, why would they being the police, give the oxygen show a different answer than what they gave us when we got answers from law enforcement back, I want to say, a year and a half ago now. His answer gives me sort of goosebumps. It gives me hope, actually. Right. He said, because our relationship to the media changes over time, and that's what we're doing now. We're adapting to the changing times. And he said it without hesitation. And he said it almost with with a bit of an earnestness to it. He said, you know, we have to, times change. We have to change with the times. So it's a really good answer for anybody who says, well, all of this like botched investigation happened in the beginning. They recognize that, you know, things could have been handled differently. And they recognize that things are happening that they can't control. They're not completely in control, but they, they can monitor and make sure it's done responsibly. Right, and they, they've been giving us more information than they ever have before, so they've changed their strategy a little bit at least. So that, that leads me to have some hope. And Maggie asked Chuck at one point when Chuck took some samples with him to be tested by you know people on, on law enforcement's end, she asked him, will we be able to see the results of that? And he said, sort of with a chuckle, I think you're, you deserve that at this point. Right. Which is really, really cool. Yeah, because we've been we've been looking into this and we we've been saying law enforcement really doesn't have to tell us anything. But I feel like he sees the real the the real power of of the reach that is is happening right now. And so as far as samples from the A-frame go, we gave the police a lot of closet samples. 
Yeah, the wood paneling from the inside of the closet downstairs under the under the stairs, that closet where the lumen all lit up. And where the blood samples were tested on the oxygen show came back that there were two people's blood in that closet. There's probably less wood paneling on the wall now than there is in, in bags that the state police have. <laughs> And uh, we were alerted by one of the old owners, Mike, who did the luminol, exactly what area pooled up the most. So we focused on that spot of the closet, tried to get as much sampling as we could. So we took wood paneling, we took part of the wall behind the paneling, and we also took part of the concrete, didn't we, Lance? Yeah, I want to say, before we get too deep into that, that we will have the individuals and the professionals involved in this on at some point. Of course. But there, there is an enormous amount of information, so this is the springboard to what will probably be, I don't know, half a dozen other episodes where we talk to Ed and we, at some point, we'll talk to Chuck or have information from Chuck, get Maggie back on, and, and you know, you can get down into the nitty-gritty details. So that said, yeah, we did take a drill and Ed and Graham drilled out a, I'd say, a, a foot by a foot square in the back of the closet, drilled down, made a made a perimeter, and then broke it up, and it went into, I think we have six or seven bags worth of concrete samples. Right. And, uh, of course, these samples, we won't have data on for months, most likely. So uh, we are working on getting these tested, but you know we, we have no answers on these right now. And Graham did at one moment take a piece of that concrete and he looked at it really closely and he put it close to his face and was, I think he was really like, really analyzing the porousness of it. And that concrete is a lot more porous than you'd, you'd expect because it's a concrete that essentially the house sits on. So that 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 concrete is down, and then they built a house on top of it. I was really surprised to see how porous that concrete was. And then Ed uh, went outside, and he took cement, and he mixed cement, and put it back into the closet to replace that square. Right. Everything that they did, and anything that was, you know, sort of evasive, yep. they fixed. Yeah. They 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 re-concreted that area. Uh, they even put a quarter in there from 2018 to show that if anyone else takes a sample or digs up that area, then if you find that quarter, that area is no older than 2018. Right. And he said it was a sort of an archaeological uh, technique. technique. Yeah. yeah. Really, really thorough. They even took one of those cameras that's on a scope that you'd use to maybe sink, like snake into drains or something. We drilled a hole in the wall, back wall of the downstairs closet, and put the camera in there. It had a light on it. And... Just looking around back there, it's all you know, it's all hollow. You know, it was there was no like reinforcements. The steps come down. Yep. And didn't find anything that was that suspicious. Uh, we actually cut out a square because we wanted to see in there a little bit better. It was really there was a sort of a frightening moment where we saw writing. Right. And the camera was so close to this piece of wood, the writing looked huge. And it turned out that it probably was just writing that was on this piece of lumber that, you know, the manufacturer put on. But it was like K-I and it looked like L or T. And oh, it, boy. It, it was, <laughs> there was that like that cold like hair on the back type yeah. moment, you know, and we're like, what the fuck is that? Yeah. Well, how about the uh, the empty box of soap that was found under those stairs? Right. Here's something that's interesting. There really wasn't anything under there other than a bunch of dust and some screws and but in the back, there was a, bo- a an empty box of soap. And the brand was Spirit. Spirit Soap. Which I found ironic. Yeah, so we took Josh, our camera guy Josh, took his, uh, his trusty extender pole, dragged it back out, and it was in good condition. You, I think you commented that it wasn't... Uh, it, it wasn't faded at all, but then realized that the, the it was never in the sun because it was in, in the wall. Of all the things in there, like an empty box of soap, I don't even, how does that even get in there? So we also took some samples from outside on the lawn. Um, they used their ground penetrating radar, of course, Ed and Graham, on the A-frame lawn. And we found a septic tank, maybe found a leach field, We're trying to find what else was under there. Might have been a propane line. Um, But then there was also sort of an anomaly or something that had been disturbed at one point. Right. This is the lawn that's on the opposite side of the house from where all this all started on the the original concrete slab. Right. That original 22 by 22 or 23 foot concrete slab. We'll get to that. Right. So this was on the other side. So Ed and Graham 
literally scanned the entire property. And you're you're right. They they took a sample from an area where there was a disturbance underneath, and we'll figure out what that is when we get the results back. Yeah, no, I mean, th- there's absolutely no data we have right now, no nothing to suggest that it's anything weird. I mean, just that something was probably dug up there at one point or at least disturbed. That's literally all they could tell us. And that's not due to any sort of technical or professional uh, inabilities. This is the process. Right. And I actually just want to say that even if we were to have found Mora or some, you know, human remains on one of these properties, we wouldn't know it now, most likely. So if we notice this anomaly, they core down on the side of it and analyze those soil samples for organic material, human remains. And if that comes back positive, then you go further with it. So it could be bones or something like that, and but I would say it's most likely not, but it could be. But we won't know for probably a couple of months at least. One technique that they did use that we tried to assist them with with our, with our new drone, which doesn't hold as much weight as it says it holds, there's a uh, thermal camera that they have. We tried to strap it to the drone so we could get a seriously high perspective of that area. Uh, the drone wouldn't pick it up. But we were able to get on a ladder and get as high as possible, once again, with Josh and his extender pole. We got as high as possible to look down at that area to see any sort of heat that might be coming from underneath the ground that would not be consistent with uh, what would naturally be there. So you see ground around it that is, you know, say blue, and then you'd see a, a red or an orange area, and you'd say, well, that doesn't make any sense why that would be there. Why is something a different temperature, a slightly warmer temperature under the ground? Right. Unfortunately, that the sun had been on that area all day, so even rocks underneath the lawn were lighting up because they were warmed by the sun. And that's something that you really should do probably around like 8 p.m. Yeah. And so we we didn't see anything weird, but we did see certain areas that had hot spots, probably due to the sun. In the future, we can probably do another trip up there and and schedule something specifically for that time frame uh, when the sun goes down and everything's cooled off at a normal temperature. Yeah, we'll see what the samples come back. But there wasn't anything obvious uh, under that spot, Um, whereas if you turned it, you could see the septic tank and you could actually make it out perfectly. So that was pretty interesting. So that kind of led me to not be super optimistic on that spot, but I really have no idea. Either way, if it comes back and there's nothing down there and there's nothing underneath the concrete slab and there's nothing in the, uh, you know, the concrete from inside the closet, Mm -hmm. that's, that's a check off the list of things that you don't have to obsess about anymore. Yeah. And, and again, you know, we know the molten reputation and we know that they were there. You know, it's a very good lead and it's a very good possibility, but if you can rule it out, that means that, anything that has to do with more isn't there. So let's focus some attention on another place. And Ed and Graham also scanned the big concrete slab that uh, Fred Murray and uh, his GPR company did a few weeks ago. They also scanned the slab on the other side of the house, which we talked about, I think, on the last episode, which is sort of like a five by three piece of concrete. Yeah, it kind of looked like a bench. If you pictured a, a crudely created concrete bench and it was positioned in a way where there were other rocks around it and it sort of looked like a seating area if you were to make a fire or something but i mean the thing's like a thousand pounds it's just it's it's in a weird spot and maybe it was there before and then people put the rocks around it to to sit but no stone literally was left unturned we flipped that thing over There were some bugs under there that probably had never seen sunlight in their whole life, so I can't imagine the stress level that suddenly shot through the roof for those guys. But they they did a a few passes with their GPR. Yeah, and they scanned the cement too, and there was nothing in that cement. Yep, there was no disturbances in the ground and nothing in the cement. And now they scanned the big slab on the opposite side of the house, the one that had already been scanned. And were we able to see results on that? They gave us the same results that we heard from Fred scan, meaning there was rebar in weird spots. Like it wasn't so much. I think the last time we talked about this, we said the rebar was around the perimeter Mm -hmm. and it turns out it wasn't, it's not quite around the perimeter. It's in a certain area. And then the middle section is left without any rebar. And there's another area that has the rebar. Um, You know, it doesn't seem like it's anything super strange. 
it's just a mystery as to what was built on there. You Googled uh, hunting towers. Right, because um, Joel said that uh, one of the GPR guys who was there, and Joel being one of the A-frame owners, uh, said that one of his people said it was a monolithic structure that that, would have, that, that, that slab would have been built for. So I Googled hunting tower, and it kind of seems like that could have been what it is. When you look at those holes that have the PVC reinforcement and it goes down beyond the concrete into the ground, it looks sort of like a footprint that it could be, you know, conducive to a hunting tower. And it might have even been there before the A-frame house was there, which would actually kind of make more sense because we know it's not angled uh, really appropriately with the house but it's possible that it existed before the A-frame did, and that would, you know, make more sense. People do hunt in that area. We heard many gunshots over the past couple days up there, so there's a lot of hunting going on in that immediate area. Yeah, there's a hunting nest that's right behind the A-frame house that's up in a tree. Also, I want to say that there was an, a, a picture of the A-frame house from, I, I'm going to say it was maybe eight or nine years ago, but I'm just guessing on that. It has a foot and a half of growth, like grass growth, right in the area of the of the slab. So who knows? That that slab could have been there from 1985, and and they built a a hunting tower on it, or they built a a swing set or something on it. Right. But we do know that there was no anomalies underneath the concrete in the soil. So that was Saturday. So I just want to say a big a big thank you to Christina and Joel for allowing us. Uh, to rummage through your house and uh, and your closet and your lawn, uh, et cetera. You guys are amazing, and please, everybody listening, please give uh, Christina and Joel of the A-Frame house some privacy. They don't need people driving by. They do have cameras. They do have snarling dogs. Just give them their privacy, please. They have an impressive amount of security cameras on their house. They really do. And I didn't even notice them until they pointed them out. Lance, as you know, hiring used to be hard. Multiple job sites, stacks of resumes, just stacks everywhere. Just, oh my God, so many stacks of paper, a confusing review process. But today, hiring can be easy and you only have to go to one place to get it done. Tell me where that place is because we need some help. ZipRecruiter.com slash MMM. ZipRecruiter, that's right. ZipRecruiter sends your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards. But, Tim, they don't stop there. Oh, no, I know. With their powerful matching technology, ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and invites them to apply to your job. And as the applications come in, ZipRecruiter analyzes each one and spotlights the top candidates so you never miss a great match. That's how intuitive it is. With results like that, it's no wonder that ZipRecruiter is the highest rated hiring site in America. I'd like to think that we might have had something to do with that stat. I would say we probably have everything to do with that stat. ZipRecruiter really owes us a lot. And right now, our listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address. What is that web address? It is ZipRecruiter.com slash MMM. So I have it right. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash MMM. That's right. ZipRecruiter.com slash MMM. Sounds like ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. So Sunday, we went to Rick Forcier's old property. And this was something that we didn't tell anyone on the podcast. We, we didn't tell the podcast, you guys. Um, we, we kept this one close to the vest because we didn't want it out there. We scanned the lawn on Forcier's property. And we also scanned a, an interesting lead that we had, which was this big concrete slab underneath the stairs, uh, which leads to Rick Forcier's door or Rick Forcier's old door, I should say. But he poured this slab and we heard from a source that it was poured on a weekend that he had told people he was out of town, which he wasn't. So that was why it was somewhat suspicious to us. Yeah, this is a very credible 
piece of information, very credible source. And the pad, which I'm, I'm calling because I don't want people to confuse all of these concrete of slabs. things. Yeah. And so it's, it's sort of the, the landing point before the four steps that go up to his porch. And the story we heard, the account that we were given was that, like you said, he was supposed to be out of town and this person happened upon him while he was either mixing the cement or pouring the cement. But he was creating that concrete pad there, which is about three feet by four feet. Maybe a little bigger, but yeah, yeah, that sounds about Tell right. Tell you what it is. It's really about, heavy. It's about eight, eight inches thick, and eight inches of concrete that size weighs about a thousand times more than you think it weighs. <laughs> and so it was reinforced. We did the ground penetrating radar over it, and notice it was reinforced with a lot of, of rebar, right? Everything about this seems like it would be normal if you take it out of context, because it's in the context of that environment and you you run the scan over it and you hear it's heavily reinforced. But I guess in the context of, well, he someone poured this concrete because it's the landing spot of the stairs. It's probably a heavily trafficked area and this person didn't want it to crack. Right. But in the context of the location, it does seem it did seem a little odd that it had so much reinforcement in it. So Ed and Graham scanned it, uh, found out there was rebar in it, and figured there's probably no human remains in it, um, as far as we could tell. But we did want to look under it, and it was really heavy. So uh, You had to buy crowbars. Two enormous crowbars, uh, thanks to, uh, to Chloe and Melina for, uh, for shepherding me there to the hardware store to get these big crowbars. And uh, so we propped this, this uh, concrete pad up, and, and lifted it up, and we actually had to remove the stairs to the porch as well. Which seemed like a really good idea. It felt like we weren't going to be able to put them back on because this was not a solid... Well, it's not the newest solid, deck. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not, it, you, it wasn't solid in the beginning, in the first place. And those screws that were holding it in just broke at a touch. Yeah. They, they were so worn. So it came off sort of like a puzzle piece. It just clipped right off. And yeah, and then we spent the next 15 or so minutes trying to get that slab up, that, up. That, that pad up. And so we did. We, uh, we, we forced the pad onto its side and we looked underneath and scanned underneath. And Graham was able to tell us that it did not seem like there were any disturbances under that. We learned a lot about GPR and how that scan looks. They had the little mini that they called it, the little handheld uh, GPR scanner, and the 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 readout on the screen shows the different layers as it goes down, and it was the most consistent that any of the scans had shown. And Graham had taken his spade, and he was this was when he was performing his soil whispering duties, and he was lightly just scraping away at the at the soil underneath and he was looking for clear distinctions that would show something is buried there so if you dig up something if you dig up the ground and you put something down there and you bury it and then you put this heavy concrete on it if you pour this heavy concrete on it the edges will have a clear distinction he was saying between light soil and dark soil and you can clearly tell that that that's not the natural way it was in the beginning. And he, he spent a long time going back and forth, scraping over the soil. And you could see very clearly that there was there was no disturbances there on top of the scan, just showing about as consistent uh, layers as, as we've seen. And like we said, we'll have these guys on to uh, to explain in a little more detail. Um, but then we replaced the slab, or I should say we, we pushed it back into its space and tried to really fit it right back in there and uh, had to dig out some soil. It was, it was uh, it gave me a lot of anxiety watching Ed stick his hand under the slab. I said, Ed, I can't even watch you do that, let alone do that myself, because if the slab had fallen, his arm would have been absolutely crushed. Would have been smushed. Yeah, and uh, not the safest thing to do, but it was kind of necessary to get the slab back or the pad back into its spot. And then he drilled the uh, the new screws that, that we bought at the hardware store. 
into the stairs and put the stairs back actually a lot more for- firm than it was b- before. Yeah, the owners were like, wow, this is much better than it was before. It was way sturdier and it was like level too. And that was when I called Ed a catch. And I said, your, your wife really needs to take care of you, Ed, because uh, it, it's no wonder you're married because you do all this all this stuff. You do you pour concrete, you you know how to use a drill with the, with the screws, the stairs, you know how to do all this uh, GPR. Swiss Army knife. <laughs> guy, guy, he knows what he's doing. Yeah, between him and Graham, like you're late. Ladies. Yeah. Ladies out there. Seriously. I mean, you got a couple of catches. And then we pivoted to the lawn. And, uh, and of course, uh, if you were paying attention on social media over the past few days, you may have noticed some articles. Uh, there was a news crew that were there. And uh, there was even some video of Graham um, using the penetrating radar on this lawn, this spot, um, sort of beneath where Rick Forcier's trailer used to be. And so there was kind of an anomaly found there as well. Or at least a disturbance. And this area that had the anomaly, probably again, in in the context of a normal property, you can say that that might have been like the leaching area, but it was too far away from where, I guess, their septic tank was. There's The well was at the back of the property. Right. And we found out where these things were on both properties, the septic tank. 